In the last video, we looked at how a guy called Buchner started the field of biochemistry by investigating the fermentation performed by yeast. Today, we'll be looking at how the field of genetics began with investigating peas, finding patterns, and theorizing about particles. Many people know the general story behind the discovery of genetics, but there are some things that I want to explain further in this video. You might have heard of Gregor Mendel, a monk growing peas in a monastery until one day he saw patterns among his pea plants. This makes it seem like he discovered it by accident, and his discovery wasn't that big of a deal. First, you have to understand the point of genetics in the 19th century. This was a time when the economy was really starting to flourish, and trade between villages, towns and cities started to become really common. As more and more people were selling things like tomatoes and sheep, competition became more and more prevalent. Whoever had the biggest tomato, or the woolliest sheep, became rich, so everyone was trying to learn how to beat the other sellers. One thing that people knew was that crossing plants that gave big tomatoes, or sheep with lots of wool, generally gave offspring that inherited those characteristics. But this didn't always work very well. If we knew how this was possible, or could learn something about breeding, there was a clear economic advantage. Entire institutions were set up to try and find how we could make breeding as effective as possible. Such institutions were built around churches and monasteries at the time, so people looked for a member of the church highly trained in the natural sciences. That's where Mendel came in. He was a trained scientist at heart and was partly only a monk because it allowed him to pursue higher education. So what did Mendel do? He wanted to spot patterns in how organisms bred and inherited traits. He picked pea plants to investigate, because 1. they did not require much space to grow, and 2. they could be self-crossed, which means you could breed a plant with itself, which turns out to be very useful. To set up the controls for his experiment, he bought not 1, not 2, but 34 different varieties of peas. Of these, he picked 22 varieties that faithfully transmitted, that is, ones whose traits were inherited across generations nearly perfectly. Over two years, he made a batch of pure breeding pea plants. Finally, for the actual experiment, he took two pure breeding pea plants, one producing smooth peas and the other producing wrinkled ones. He first bred these two plants together and found that the offspring always produced smooth peas. This was already interesting, since you would expect the offspring to have some smooth peas and some wrinkled ones, or at least slightly wrinkled, slightly smooth ones, but neither of these were seen. He went one step further and bred it with itself, expecting all the offspring to be smooth. What he found was that three quarters of the offspring had smooth peas, but exactly one quarter had the wrinkled peas of its grandparents. Where did this wrinkledness come from? Mendel reckoned that the smooth offspring of the smooth and wrinkled peas inherited something from both the plants, but only the smoothness prevailed as if smoothness was somehow dominant over wrinkledness. His idea was that traits of the parent were inherited through things called particles of inheritance. Offspring of two parents would receive one particle from each parent, two in total. In this case, the smooth pea gave a smooth particle, and the wrinkled pea gave a wrinkled particle. When the offspring had two different particles, Mendel thought that the dominant particle was the one that gave the offspring its trait in this case, the smooth particle. When the recessive particle lost, it could still be inherited by that plant's offspring. Since this plant had two different particles, there was a half chance for either one to be inherited. So when it bred with itself, each parent would contribute one of two particles to the offspring, resulting in four possible combinations. The offspring could be smooth-smooth, smooth-wrinkled, wrinkled-smooth, or wrinkled-wrinkled. This explained why Mendel saw three times as many smooth peas as wrinkled peas, since by his theory, there were three different combinations that could give smooth peas, but only one combination that could give wrinkled peas. But wait a second, how did Mendel know about these particles? He could neither see them nor prove that they existed. All Mendel had was a scientific model, a theory that could explain the data that he got from his experiment. He tested his model not just with smooth and wrinkled peas, but with six other traits. For every trait that he tested with, he 
it got ratios that were around 3 to 1. But this wasn't enough, because although his model was very good, that was only because he made it to fit the data, an ad hoc explanation. To make it convincing, he needed to make predictions using the model on things that he couldn't have predicted without it. His first prediction was that if you took the smooth pea offspring from his experiment and self-bred them, two-thirds would give the same 3 to 1 ratio of smooth peas to wrinkled peas. This was because his model showed that two-thirds of the smooth peas would be identical to their parents, and so would result in the same offspring. He turned out to be absolutely right. His second prediction was that if he bred the offspring of smooth and wrinkled pea plants with a pure breeding wrinkled pea plant, half the offspring would be smooth and half would be wrinkled. This was because the hybrid could contribute either a smooth particle or a wrinkled particle, but the wrinkled pea plant could only contribute a wrinkled one, giving one combination that would give smooth peas and another that would give wrinkled ones, half and half. Again, he turned out to be absolutely right. Still, after all his efforts, when he published his findings in 1866, he didn't receive a lot of attention. Scientists of the time found his explanation to be far too perfect and mathematical, not representative of the complex nature of inheritance. Although they were right, Mendel was right in that genetics was quite mathematical at its basics. It wasn't until the 20th century that Mendel was rediscovered and proven right, specifically by a scientist called Thomas Hunt Morgan. To learn more about what he discovered, subscribe to GeneSpeak and support this video by liking and sharing. Thanks for watching.